So, welcome beautiful humans to the next session. Juggling 300 integrations while scaling to 10 million signals per day, that's what these guys are telling us for the next session. Uh, David Foley and Christian Waller. Have fun. Really? Yeah, oh my. it doesn't matter. Uh, hi, N uh, nice to meet you. Um, so, um, the title already gives it, gives it away. Um, some of you might have done the math. Uh, while 10 million signals, it sounds quite like a lot. It turns out it's actually less than 120 messages per second. So I do think there are a lot of systems out there that handle a way greater load than we do. So from that point, our talk will not be about scaling. So sorry if you're here for scaling, uh, this is not the talk for you. But on the other side, it turns out uh, handling 300 integrations, that's, that's quite a bit because integrating with 300 uh, different parties, that's a lot of domain, technical, and organizational complexity. Um, and we want to uh, cover this topic today. Now, if I say we, uh, my name is Christian. Uh, I'm a software developer, software architect, and a bit of a consultant. Um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, but most, most of my stuff on Twitter is actually about mountains, but a bit about software development as well. And I'm your host to today together with my colleague, this thing on? Ah, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel. Uh, I'm a software developer as well. Uh, in, the, in the previous iteration of my working life, I used to be a researcher in mathematical logic. Yeah, so we both work at Trustbit. It's like a, we, are, we are a remote first company doing software development, consulting and data science. Um, and Trustbit was responsible for delivering the product that we will uh, talk about today from an end-to-end -end perspective. Now, um, what can you expect from us today? Uh, we want to give you a kind of an experience report, uh, an experience report where we kind of grew and evolved the product over more than three years, where we started really from scratch and we started without having any domain experts at hand and we started without having any established team. Even more, I was the only person working at Trustbit before we actually started that project, so we were really a bunch of people uh, scattered around Europe that, that started to work together because Trustbit is also a, a distributed company, so even pre-COVID, so we really started in a distributed way um, delivering that product. Um, so we kind of want to give you an idea how it, it was possible in our setting to learn about our domain, how it was possible for us to deal with changing team structures, and how we used uh, frequent experiments to, to learn a bit our, uh, about our domain and to, to evolve our, our product. Um, over the talk, we will revisit uh, um, this artifact that we called Architectural Blueprint, where we try to capture important decisions that we made in our project. Uh, most of them were done in a deliberate way, but a couple of them, they turned out in hindsight to be quite valuable. So if we would probably redo the project or the, the product, we would also probably redo a lot of these decisions. So they, they turned out quite valuable for us. And we will also uh, revisit this context map. Now, this is more or less the system state that is right now. It's quite complicated already, uh, but we will gradually walk you through it and try, try to use the context map to illustrate a bit how we started from a very simple system and how we ended up in a, in a, in a quite a complex one. And if you, if you are into context mapping, you might get a, a more value out of it. We, we won't cover all of the notations in detail, um, but it uh, hopefully helps you to, to get an idea about um, uh, our system. Now, speaking of context, Daniel, can you give us a, a bit of an overview of the context of, the, uh, of our product? Sure. So let's start with the start, the birth of our product uh, with its infancy. So this is how it looked like. Um, to protect the names of the innocent, we changed the names of our clients. Uh, we were working for a company called Small V, and Small V was a spin-off company of a larger company that we'll call Big L. Uh, Big L is uh, a company that has been active in the logistics sector for a long time. Internally, they developed um, and invested a lot into digitalization efforts in logistics. And at some point, they decided they wanted to spin off some of these efforts into a new company, Small V, to offer products in the logistics sector on the free market. Um, so the CTO of Small V was fond of domain-driven design. So when we started our project, our product, there was already a domain design, including two domains. 
One of the domains is called GPSA, which is short for GPS aggregation. That would be the domain we were working on. And there was already another domain um, called ETA, which stands for estimated time of arrival. So what this means uh, will become clearer soon. So we started our project, we moved into our domain, but we were no experts in logistics. We had to learn what logistics should mean for us and what our domain was supposed to do. So we started out with a well-known method. Uh, I'm sure most of you uh, know it and have uh, applied it a couple of times already. So let me be very brief here. We started with an event storming session. It's a collaborative workshop format involving post-its. You can do it uh, on site, in real life or remotely. Um, and the intent is to bring together developers and domain experts to build a common understanding of how the domain works, build a common language, and just uh, talk to each other so that they become, you get a common understanding of what you want to do. So after this session, our event storming board looked like this. A lot of post-its. Maybe Christian, uh, you can tell us a bit more about the context. Yeah, sure. Um, so you might wonder logistics. I mean, probably we, we there's everything uh, to be said about logistics is, is covered in the blue book, in the Domain Driven Design book by Eric Evans. So we, it was, wasn't probably that hard for us. As it turns out, logistics is really huge. There are a lot of subdomains in there, a lot of activities, processes, so it's really, really complicated and, and quite a rich domain. Um, what we found out, for us it was quite simple because we just had to worry about trucks. So it was really as simple as that. Now, what do I mean? Imagine there's a factory, for example, located in Vienna, and you want to ship some goods to a ware warehouse somewhere in Berlin. Most of the time, that's done on the road via, via a truck. Um, and what we learned, we don't really need to worry too much about the transport planning and how, how that transport is organized, how it's executed, or, or, or the like. We just worry about the position of the truck. Um, when, when you do transports, there are a couple of organizations involved. Uh, usually there's a shipper, for example, owning the factory, loading the goods. Um, then there's a carrier organization. Most of the time they are in charge of executing the transport. They own maybe the truck. Um, and there's also the customer organization. The one or the organization that actually care about getting the goods that are on the transport. And that these customers, they have a bunch of questions usually um, related to transport. So they for example, they want to know when will the goods arrive, so what's the estimated time of arrival? Or, a bit related to that, they also want to know where is the truck right now at the moment. Um, and as Daniel already hinted, there were two domains in small v from, from the get-go. Um, and we as the GPSA domain, we were kind of in charge to try to come up with an answer to the question, where's the truck right now? So th this was roughly our, our domain goal, you could say. Now, how does this look like? Most trucks, they have GPS modules mounted on them. These GPS modules, they send signals in regular intervals to an organization that we call provider, a GPS provider. We as a domain, we are in contact with these providers, we obtain the signals, um, process them internally, and then provide a way to, for our customers to, to, to get to these signals so that they are able to find an answer to their question. What we also learned in, in this event storming that a lot of custom, uh, yeah, so, sorry, yeah. And regarding the other question, this ETA domain, they need our support. So that they are able to come up with an answer, what is the estimated time of arrival? They somehow need the position data, they do their calculations, and then provide, um, again, um, the customer a way to, to, um, to get uh, to the answer. So, these were the basic use cases. We were kind of aware of them, and when we were doing the event storming, we also found out that for a lot of customers, it's quite relevant um, to, to get a kind of an aggregated view of signals because customers sometimes, they don't operate just with one carrier, but with a lot of different carriers out there. And these carriers usually, they use a lot of different GPS providers. So we as a domain, we try to integrate these GPS providers. And at the moment, we integrate with over 300 different ones. We, we, we get the data, we process it, and then we pro uh, provide a unified channel towards um, the, the customer so that they are able to, to have an easy way to integrate and get the data. So this, this, these were more or less our, our main use cases um, from, from the start. Now, Daniel already mentioned that big L. As it turned out, they already had a kind of an aggregation in place. Um, 
And they used a tool which seemingly was a perfect fit for that. They used an, kind of an enterprise service bus because what they thought, it's, it's a nice tool to integrate with a lot of different providers. They, it supports a ton of different protocols um, and it's generic, obviously, but it turns out for them there's a lot of complexity involved, a lot of processes and this integration, they were struggling a lot with the technical and the domain complexity involved in that. So, one of the reasons, that was one of the reasons why that, that small v was founded to, to start off with a new, with a fresh approach. Now, Daniel, can you tell us a bit more about the details? Sure. <clears throat> so now, we know a bit about our context, about the domain. Uh, it's time to grow up a bit, move from infancy to childhood. So let's go back to our event storming board. Now, the event storming board helped us understand what our domain was supposed to do. So we had a look at the post-its and we found that you could find clusters of post-its that were closely related. Um, on the left-hand side of our event storming board, the things that happened first, we found that lots of these post-its were related to onboarding these carriers. So the carriers, these were the companies that owned the trucks, and we had to get to know them, we had to get some information from them in order so that we were able to contact the telematics providers who on their servers had the GPS signals so that we could get them. So the left-hand side was related to onboarding carriers, and then the right-hand side, these were post-its concerned with the actual aggregation of these signals from the providers, as well as forwarding these signals to the customers. Christian, could you maybe show us how this looks from a system context point of view? Yeah, sure. So essentially, this is our, our, our main uh, diagram from a, a very top-level perspective. We over some channels, we get credential information from, from these carrier organizations. We then use that creden these credential information to contact the GPS providers. We obtain the signals, process them, and then uh, forward them to, to, to our customers via, via different channels. Now, plotting this on the context map, it's quite easy, actually. So it, it looks very, very similar. We as a domain, we are um, communicating with the GPS providers. We, we get the signals and then we just forward it to at that point in time, our only consumer, the ETA uh, dom domain. Um, but one important thing um, happened at that, that point in time. We were offered a, a kind of a partnership, a partnership with that big L company because they did a lot of these integrations and they offered us to, to gain access to their knowledge. They offered us, for example, to give request and response samples for, for these provider integrations. They offered us to give sample or test credentials so that we were able to kind of get into a, a fast working mode, more or less. So they offered us a lot of knowledge, and at that point in time, they got nothing in return from our side. Um, so, but it enabled us, it enabled us to find our focus, to find our focus from the domain perspective, because with that partnership in mind, it was quite obvious for us that we start to integrate with the providers and not worry too much on how we would be able to obtain all, all of that credentials via that onboarding process that Daniel already mentioned. So we were just focusing on provider integration and uh, building up capabilities to forward signals to, to our customers. So that was quite nice because it enabled us to find a domain focus. But on the other side, we kind of worried or didn't really have a clue on how we should actually get started. So Daniel, how did we start? Indeed, so we went away from our event storming session and discussions with the domain experts, having a clue of what to do, focusing on the aggregation part. But we were a development team, so we wanted to sit down and code. But as Christian mentioned, we were also a new team. We didn't know each other, we were newly formed, we were working together remotely. It was Christian, myself, and our colleague Ian Russell. So, we had to make some decisions first. Uh, first decision was, which programming language do we actually want to use to write our software when we sit down and code? So, we got to know each other a bit, and it turns out that all of us uh, were very fond of functional programming. We had experience with it, we found that it was a very nice way to write code that is readable and maintainable, so soon we decided we wanted to use a functional programming language. And we were in the good position that uh, the CTO of Small V did not only embrace domain-driven design, but also thought that team autonomy was a good thing. So we had uh, a number of possibilities that we could choose from. Um, so we had to decide 
on which particular functional programming language we wanted to use, and we tried to be kind of objective about it. We looked at these, um, shared with each other, and wrote down what we think are the pros and cons, but no language really um, crystallized itself as the clear best, so we made a decision. Um, we chose F-sharp, the functional programming language of the .NET framework, um, and Looking back, I think what pushed us over the edge towards F-sharp was the fact that in our team, we actually had an expert in F-sharp. Ian was very good. He had even written a book on F-sharp. So I think that pushed us over the edge that we really, uh, it, fitted, it fit our team very well. So great, we had our programming language. We could sit down and code. Well, not yet. One more step. Uh, we tried to agree on some architectural um, goals that we wanted to reach. We wanted to start our architectural blueprint, and we agreed that we wanted to keep things as simple as possible, keep things simple and stupid. Um, so at that point in time, we wanted it to apply to all of the things we do. At that point in time, one of the main questions was, how do we want to actually deploy our application? One of the requirements was that it should run in the cloud, in a particular cloud provider. So Looking at its offerings, we decided to keep things as simple as possible. We should use as serverless a technology as possible. So cloud functions or we were on Google Cloud, so App Engine, these kinds of things where you don't have to write a lot of DevOps code. So in particular, we wanted to avoid Kubernetes um, just because we thought, try to be as simple as possible as long as it works. We want to focus our time writing business code and not DevOps code. Great. We were aligned, and now we really did sit down and code. We drafted a software architecture of our first bounded context. We sat down and we implemented it. It looked roughly like this. Um, we realized that there were different types of providers that kind of work differently. We called them pull and push, depending on um, the technical way that you would get the signals. The pull providers, we had to go out and fetch signals. The push providers, we would open an endpoint and they would push signals to us. So there were different types of providers. We were aware of that. We implemented different components and the signals we got from them would feed into a signal pipeline which did things which we wanted to behave the same for all of the providers. For example, validation of the latitude and longitude, stuff like that. And after that, uh, there would be another component actually dealing with the forwarding. The validated signals should go to our customers and they would hopefully be happy because finally they would receive the signals. So uh, that's great. Um, we sat down, we implemented that. We implemented a handful of providers. We put in uh, these sample credentials that we got from Big L and things worked. We were very happy. So small v realized, okay, we have something working now, let's go out and find a customer. And luckily or unluckily, they were successful. We soon got our first customer, and now we realized that's a bit of a problem, because going back to our event storming board, it turns out we only implemented this right-hand side of the event storming board, aggregating and forwarding. But there were all of these post-its uh, about onboarding, but we hadn't written a single line of code for that, and now we had our customers. So what shall we do? Well. We made it work and we did what you had to do, right? We did it manually. So it was a manual process that was done by the development team. And luckily for us, at that point in time, our team grew by one person. Uh, our colleague Alex joined us. You might remember him. He gave a talk about uh, provider horror stories at yesterday's uh, Halloween reception. So we were very lucky. He joined us in a PO, PM kind of role. and. Uh, Actually, he took over most, most of the things that were necessary to do for onboarding these carriers. It fit his other responsibilities kind of well because, of course, this onboarding was a lot of communication, writing emails back and forth, taking notes, that kind of thing. And in the end, he obtained these credentials, which we just inserted into the database as our job as developers. So it worked, um, but we soon realized that when we were doing this, um, Alex, as a non-developer, um, he found it to be a bit intransparent. He handed us these credentials, we put them in, and we said, well, it's working, but he couldn't check it for himself. So he soon asked, where are the user interfaces? It's just the backend. So luckily, we went back to our event storming board and we found we already have a post-it for that. Somewhere <laughs> in the middle of our event storming board, uh, we had a post-it, uh, a cluster, which were related to making what our system does somehow transparent to our users. So 
we decided to start working on that, mainly because it would help our own process, make us more effective. So we would start work on this user interface and we would call it fleet. So we were somewhere at the uh, left-hand side of this picture. We had a prototype. Well, it was kind of a car, good. The engine was missing, you still had to push it, but it was kind of working. So that was very nice. But we were also successful, we had customers, so um, we had to manage all of these manual processes, writing the code, and so on and so forth. So maybe to explain how we managed all of this is a good uh, time to talk a bit about how we work together. Yeah, so you, you could see it as a kind of, we, we were starting to grow up to, to be more mature, so we kind of, kind of revisit our blueprint and um, thought a bit about, okay, how can we make sure that our development process is kind of efficient and effective in, in both ways. So first of all, it kind of meant for us um, that we want to work as async as possible. So at Trustbit and especially in our team, everybody has very diverse working schedules. So we have time overlap, but it's very, very limited. So we wanted to make sure that we get the best out of that, which from a coding perspective, for example, it meant that we were doing a lot of pull requests and use, we, are, we were using pull requests as the main way to collaborate on code. We did one or the other mob or pairing session, but most of the work was done in, in pull requests simply because it, we wanted to embrace the async uh, nature of working together. Because on the other side, we wanted to make sure that the time that we spend in a, in a sync way where we have sh uh, um, an overlap on time as, as good as possible. So over the, over the years, we kind of started to establish a, a toolkit that worked quite well for us. And it kind of started by uh, using an interest map to kind of document our personal preferences, both from the domain perspective and also from the technical perspective. And on the other side, once per week, we have like, um, we, we use a kind of a story mapping approach where we once per week meet, we kind of review what we have achieved the last week and we also discuss a bit what is important in, in this week and what will be important in the next week so that we kind of, as a team, get an, a, a rough idea of what should we focus in, 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 uh, in, in this week. Now, you might wonder, documenting interests on one side and knowing what to do on the other side, um, there must be a gap. And obviously, we were spending time modeling together be because you somehow have to bridge that gap. So our modeling efforts, you could maybe roughly describe it in two main phases. On one side, we were aiming for a discovery and understanding phase where, where it was all about getting an idea of the problems that we should solve and try to make some sense of, um, of, uh, yeah, of, of the landscape, more or less. We used techniques, for example, like event storming. Daniel already uh, mentioned it. Or we used uh, something like a business model canvas or also domain storytelling. So these are all great tools to give you like a, a high-level overview of how stuff is kind of connected or could be connected. Um, and once we, we, had, we had that rough understanding, we used um, tools, for example, like a bounded context canvas or spikes and code probes or, or even architectural decision records to gradually make that understanding more concrete and uh, get closer to, um, to the code. So these, these tools, it kind of helped us to, to align both on the uh, domain perspective and also on the, um, the technical perspective so that we were kind of able to, to, to work in an async uh, way and um, do, do, do most of the work on our own schedules. So for us, it kind of meant we were having, we, we found a way to, to have a process that is working for us as individual, but also working for us as, as, a, as a team. So it, it kind of tried to respect all of, of our personal needs. So that was quite, quite nice. Now, revisiting briefly our context map, Daniel already mentioned that that fleet application popped up, up and we did. What, you had, what we had to do at that point in time, we just made it work. So we used a shared kernel, and, and you will hear a bit more about that uh, decision later on. Um, and what also happened around, uh, around that point in time, um, our, our PM, he started to document a lot of this communication. He started to, to uh, document his emails, uh, he used the wiki, and he did it in a, in a really in a structured way, and in hindsight, that documentation, that was actually like the kind of seams that uh, turned out to be actually bound in context that we implemented at a later point in time. So at that point in time, we already knew that there is something there and we also read had roughly a name, but no real technical artifact. So that was ki kind of inter an interesting observation um, uh, afterwards. Now, 
what was kind of important for us from the architectural point of view, and really right from the start, is that we build an architecture that allows uh, a dynamic reteaming approach. Now, some of you might not really know what dynamic teaming or uh, reteaming is, uh, but Daniel will, will tell you now. So, dynamic reteaming is a term coined by Heidi Helfand, and um, it's supposed to just uh, mean any change in team compositions, team members joining, leaving, teams splitting or merging, that kind of thing. And it, I think she gave it a name to emphasize that this is something you should be explicit about. It shouldn't be something that just happens to you. Um, ideally, um, you have a kind of idea why you want to do that. And even if you don't, even if it just happens to you, you should take it seriously and you should uh, work with it, you should do it in an explicit way, not just throw in a new team member and say, that's it. So to understand why we kind of aimed for some dynamic reteaming, um, let's take another look at what our domain was supposed to do. So remember, we were supposed to provide um, aggregated GPS signals to our customers, and to do so in a good way, we needed to support a lot of telematics providers. Remember the 300 integrations from the title of the talk. So the handful that we had, wasn't enough, uh, we needed something like this. So we were still three developers, one project manager, so uh, using simple mathematics, you will realize that each developer would have to implement 100 integrations. So that seemed like a lot. So what we wanted to do was, uh, we wanted to, so that we are able to, in a fast way, support a lot of telematics providers, temporarily scale up our team, get some developers on our team that would just focus, help us with implementing integrations, and then maybe they will leave again, focus on other projects, or they will stay on the team. So, and to enable that, um, from our experiences implementing the first couple of providers, uh, we came up with a process. So we wrote some documentations, things you have to consider when integrating with a provider, things like timestamp formats, time zoning, just things we observed during the, the uh, first couple of implementations. We produced some technical artifacts intended to make the dev experience nice. We had a .NET template that a developer could use to quickly get set up. They didn't have to prepare the development environment, uh, running our real application, something more complicated. We wanted to be it to be really fast, the developer should be able to sit down and in the first couple of days of joining the project really work, uh, produce his first uh, telematics provider integration, get it deployed and see the results in our fleet UI, for example. So the idea was, with this process, we could get someone on the team, maybe do the process a couple of times and leave again. That was the idea, so let's have a look at how it turned out. So this is how our team size changed over the three years of our project. So early 2020, we really started ramping up our team size. And during this ramp up phase, we really um, executed what we had intended. Namely, we really got two colleagues from Trustbit on board for just one month. They focused on, uh, on implementing provider integrations. They used the process and it worked kind of well. So, the main advantage was they didn't have to get a deep domain understanding. It was really just one part of one bounded context and with our process and the tooling, they were able to um, get going very fast, just having to understand a bit of the ubiquitous language that was related to this particular problem. So that was the only time that we actually scaled up our, our dev team in this way. Um, it was sufficient, we got a number of integrations, uh, our customers were happy. Um, but still, you can see, over time, our uh, team size changed quite a bit. Um, so overall, we had roughly six reteaming, six changes of team compositions per year. So, that, so to me, this seems like quite a lot. And uh, we think that it really helped to have this provider development process, because even if someone joined our team expecting to be on the team longer, it was a great first onboarding task. Uh, we already had this process set up, they could get going very quickly, produce some value, feel productive, and then start to learn more about the domain later on, picking up other tasks, being able to gradually become a domain expert uh, as well. So, um, I'd like to zoom out a bit now. Um, I've talked now about what happened in this aggregation bounded context, producing these provider integrations. But during that time, also other things happened in our domain. Uh, as Christian indicated, um, there were two bounded contexts here at the bottom, the collaboration bounded context, 
whose main purpose was this onboarding process, and also a provider registry, which contained some meta information about telematics providers, which we uh, were found useful, but didn't really use at that point in time. For example, some telematics providers required a payment so that you can use them, but not all of them. We collected this information, actually our PM did, in a structured fashion in a wiki, and during that time, we started really moving this information that we learned from this tooling into actual code. So our collaboration-bounded context became an F-sharp application, and our provider registry became just a JSON file containing this information that we included as a shared kernel in many of our applications, in many of our bounded contexts. Um, and not only did we start implementing these bounded contexts based on our learnings, but during that time, um, because we had so many provider integrations now, we could make our customers happy. In particular, it was time for Big L to become our customer. Remember, we had a partnership, they helped us along a lot, and now we were ready to really supply them with the service they wanted from us. They wanted to get rid of their own legacy GPS aggregation, use our service. And we were good enough for that at that point, and we realized that now, our aggregation-bounded context, it had too many things to do. It would aggregate and forward the signals, and we realized it makes sense to spin out of our aggregation-bounded context another bounded context that we called API, with the intention that this would be the bounded context that deals with our core feature of forwarding signals, because there were many requirements surrounding that that aggregation-bounded context did not care about. For example, providing public API docs for our customers and dealing with their network security. So, um, many things happened. We were very productive in aggregation, implemented some bounded contexts, found a new one. Um, seems like everything was going great, wasn't it, Christian? Um, yeah, kind, kind of, actually. So, we, we were struggling a bit from scaling pains and resource exhaustions at that point in time, but most of these problems, we were kind of able to contain them in a very local way, as in local to a bounded context. So, problems didn't really bleed over to, to other parts of our application. So, that was kind of a nice experience. But and I've already hinted it, we still had that shared kernel in place. Um, and it initially it was quite, quite, quite a good thing, but over time it really slowed us down. Um, deployments took, took ages in that area. Um, uh, refactorings rippled through quite a big code base, so uh, code, code, <laughs> um, uh, code place. Um, so it was, it, wasn't, it was getting worse over time, actually. And one of the reasons was that uh, fleet and aggregation, they were heading, heading in different directions. So aggregation was all about scalability, availability, and making sure that we are able to integrate a lot of providers in a fast way. Fleet, on the other side, it was more or less uh, a dashboard application, uh, having a shiny UI, keeping a lot of data around, and making sure that, that we are able to provide good reports. And that chat kernel, it kind of glued them together and, and caused a lot of problems. Now, you might not know what a shared kernel is. In our case, it looked roughly like that. We had a shared database and we had a lot of a shared, shared code. Um, so everything was kind of more or less glued together in, in a single CI CD pipeline in our case, operated by GitHub and um, Terraform. Uh, and it meant in our case, whenever there was a change to the database, whenever there was a change to one of these code pieces, it, mean, it meant that we need to redeploy everything. And there were a lot of resources to be deployed, so it really took, to, took a long time. Now, how did we manage to resolve our shared kernel? In our case, Daniel already kind of introduced it. At that point in time, we, we needed a kind of a pub Publish subscribe-based subscribe API for our actually API about the context. So Fleet could use that endpoint and subscribe to messages being published there and use that information to build up its own database, its own data storage over time. Um, and we were able to, over the course of one and a half years, to gradually remove these shared dependencies, this 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 shared kernel, and get through autonomy for for the bounded contexts. And um, the only there's only a small piece of shared code um, left, and we learned that the hard way, that it really pays off to make your contracts between the bounded contexts very, very explicit. And in our case, we kind of codified them. So whenever we break one of the contracts by accident, our build breaks as well. So um, for us, that, that was uh, kind of a nice learning. Now, you might wonder, was that shared kernel worth the effort? I guess 
yes, it was, simply because initially it really allowed us to iterate in a fast way, to come up with that fleet UI. We could reuse a lot of our code, a lot of our data structure, and just, just build up a UI um, and evolve it over time. As I already hinted, it took us quite a, a long time to get rid of it, so there's quite a lot of work involved. Um, but for us, the payout was definitely um, uh, positive, I would say. And uh, what I also mentioned, we kind of learned it, that it really pays out to uh, understand the contracts between the bounded contexts and also really make sure that, that you model them in a very, very explicit way. Now, looking at the context map, it turns out it's quite boring. We, we were kind of able to get rid of that shared kernel and just hook it, hook it up to the same endpoint that our API bounded context was already using. So afterwards, it, it, it just looked nice and, and it just worked more or less. So this brings us more or less to, to, to another phase. Now, we, we got most of our technical problems kind of contained, but there was this nasty guy, that customer. Um, and we, 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 we got a lot of um, questions from our customers that more or less boiled down to the same question, actually, with the, which, which was roughly like, where are the signals for my use case? And use case was usually something very, very transport related, but for us the relevant part was that they were not getting the signals that they were expecting to get. So for us, it usually meant that we were questioning ourselves. Did we have a bug on our side? or was the, pro, um, the device just not sending any data? So we found a very, very nice solution from the development point of view. We tossed it over the fence to our PO, and the problem was solved. Um, not really for him, uh, because it meant that he, he needed to do a lot of manual work, uh, digging into logs, finding out um, potential uh, reasons of why signals were not uh, being forwarded to the customers. Um, but it had a quite a, uh, an, an interesting effect for us. On one side, he learned a lot about the system, but even more important, he got a lot of domain knowledge while doing all of that manual, tedious work. So over time, our PM started to be the domain expert that we were actually longing for. He, he over the time, by doing all of that manual work that started by documenting stuff in the wiki do, and doing, doing log investigations in, in our production system, um, he, he, he got a, a quite a, a, a good grasp of how these provider integrations work and how the domain is actually working. So, so he was the domain expert that we needed. And from that role, it, it, he, he was kind of able to come up with concepts and ideas uh, of a bounded context that was actually able to uh, solve the questions that our customers had so that we could get rid of that manual process and provide them um, uh, uh, an application or a bounded context that solved their problems in a, in a very, very structured way. So in this case, our modeling was actually really on the spot. So it, it was a very pleasant experience. Uh, and I guess it was always like this, Daniel. Uh, if only it had been so, yes. But uh, I'd like to take the time now to talk a bit about a crime we kind of committed during our project, and I would just call it implicit modeling. Um, so what did we do? Um, let's take another look at the system we built. Uh, one way of looking at it is like this. Uh, remember, name of our domain is GPSA, and on the top, there's some customer who wanted some signals. And remember, there were all these other organizations, these carriers with the trucks, and our idea was, using uh, our domain, using the collaboration-bounded context, these guys should collaborate using our domain. Our customer who interested in the signals should invite his business partners, they sign up, they provide their credentials using uh, our system, and we would aggregate it and forward it to the guy who actually wanted the signals. So this was not bad. Many of our customers were happy with that, uh, but not all of them. Some customers would like uh, to do this aggregation, would like to receive the signals in a different way. And they wanted kind of something like this. They didn't want to collaborate with their business partners using our system. Um, they have been doing logistics for a long time, maybe, and they were already in contact with all of their business partners. They were collaborating with them. They were having daily phone calls, writing emails. Maybe even in the past, they obtained these credentials because they had some in-house aggregation already. So they had in mind, they didn't want to do this again. They didn't want to invite their business partners again to collaborate using our system. They said, we have everything. We just want to put in these credentials we obtained into the system and get the aggregated uh, signals out. Just use it in a kind of self-service instead of a collaborative way. Um, 
So we understood that, and now we had to make a decision. Uh, what do we do? Um, I guess the best thing would be, well, it's a new use case, let's model it explicitly. Well, as you can guess from the title of this section, we didn't do that. Uh, what we actually did was this. We took our existing model, and we bent and twisted it in a way so that it would just kind of seem to our customers that it was doing what they wanted it to do. So we had these kind of ghost organizations. Remember, our system kind of required this collaboration, so there needed to be these carriers. But we had to pretend somehow that they are there so to make our system work. But uh, we did some hacky things uh, that, so that there didn't actually have to be users behind these organizations. To our customer, it looked like we fulfilled his use case very well. Uh, and uh, so they, the customer was very happy that we were able to quickly uh, just implement this new scenario, this new use case. But of course, there was a drawback. Uh, we were crying before going to sleep because uh, Developing such a system is, of course, problematic because now we had this model um, and before we could think and reason about it very easily. But now we always had to keep in mind this edge case, the special case of these funky organizations which didn't have any users, right? You couldn't send them an email, for example, right? You always had to keep that in mind. Um, so in the end, we, have, we had a payoff. We had a good time to market. It was quite easy to make this work, but it made our lives harder as well. We had to carry a heavy cognitive load around with us when developing the this system, always keeping that in mind, having strange bugs because we didn't keep it in mind, that kind of thing. So in the end, I would say, it paid off. In the end, we got rid of this over a year or maybe more, we gradually introduced explicitly the second scenario, we migrated all the data, uh, our customers didn't even notice it. It was hard work, but in the end our heavy cognitive load disappeared. We had now two explicitly modeled scenarios, the collaborative way, the self-service way, uh, but our, the, the main point was that our customers didn't have to wait this year. They had it right away because we took this debt, right? It was a modeling debt. We uh, thought we have to take it, but we knew we had to get rid of it at some point as well. We had to repay it. And what helped us a lot with this and other debts we took was the idea of a wall of debt uh, due to uh, Matthias. Uh, so this is the story map we were working with. Uh, Christian introduced it before. It's what we were using to organize our work. And we had on the uh, right-hand side a story map uh, consisting of user stories, things, new features they wanted to develop. But ne right next to it, we kept our wall of debt, where in the same fashion, we remembered the things we wanted to do to fix our model, to introduce these explicit models and do other housekeeping uh, repayment of technical debts. And I think having this always on the same board when we would meet and discuss what we wanted to do this week, um, we would always also talk about the housekeeping things that we could fit in so not have any refactoring sprints, try to organically uh, just, you know, take a user story, implement that, but then take a housekeeping story and do that. And so uh, I think this helped us a lot, making this depth explicit and working on them just the same way that we would work on user stories. So Christian, I think we're closing in on the end of our talk. Does this mean our product is about to retire? Uh Maybe, maybe not. At that point in time, we are probably already quite to the right side of, of our prototype. So we, we've done a couple of prototypes, we experimented a bit, um, and they were all successful, which in sometimes is kind of unfortunately, because for our development team of our team, it meant that we um, were juggling, uh, juggling a lot with complexity. There was a lot of technical and organizational complexity involved. Um, and on the other side, we also felt that we were kind of lacking domain knowledge or deep domain knowledge because people worked in our team worked all over the place as more or less. So after, after a bit, we kind of felt the urge to specialize a bit or to, to dive deeper in certain areas. And for us, the bounded context were the kind of enabler for that. So imagine you're interested in building scalable applications then the aggregation bounded context in our case is maybe the perfect fit because it's all about scalability and availability. If you really like to build shiny UIs, then the fleet bounded context is maybe the thing you want to focus on. So we are bounded contexts. We, over the time, we started to dive deeper into certain areas of, the, of our domain. So not, not every developer was now an expert in, in all of our domain, in all of our bounded contexts, but you started to choose the one 
that is more interesting to you or where there's a technolo technology aspect that you're really interested in. Uh, and over that time, you also start obviously to get a deeper domain knowledge to, to deeply understand um, the problems you want to solve in that boundary context. So having that focus via boundary context, it really paid, uh, paid off for us because we were able to manage the complexity of our domain. But it also raised a couple of questions because we slowly we're starting to, 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 to get in a bit more in a specialized way. So should we kind of re revise our development process? Is this really going to work if, if people are focusing on one specific part? Are we maybe building knowledge silos over time? Are we, are we maybe um, missing a dedicated role in our team? So that's all roughly the point where, where we stand right now. So we, we don't really have an answer yet of how we, we want to evolve our development process, how, of how we want to evolve um, our teams with, with having that focus. So I guess there's a lot of um, tools in the domain-driven design toolkit out there that, that can help us to find um, um, the, uh, a new development process, but we, 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 we didn't find one yet. Now, looking a final time at our context map. So we le left out a lot of details, um, that's roughly the, the the state of our system as it is right now. Um, so it's it's gotten quite complicated from 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 where we actually started, and um, we left, like I mentioned, we left out a lot of details um, in 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 between. Um, and it's now maybe also time to revisit our blueprint the final time because one one item uh, is is missing up there, and um, initially we didn't really grasp the importance of doing experiments, doing a lot of prototypes, and just just trying, trying out things, because in hindsight, this was probably the main enabler to understand our domain and to evolve our, uh, our domain and to, to change our system over time. So that's, that's probably the main aspect. What else did we learn, Daniel? Indeed, uh, what did we learn? Well, we learned something very important. It's impo important to iterate, right? But I guess you're thinking that right now, right? I don't have to tell you this uh, if you're attending a DDD conference. So I'd like to try to find some focused learnings uh, about iteration that we picked up during our project. Um, so of course you iterate on your model, your code, your architecture, and when you iterate on these kinds of things, um, we found the following. Um, we think it was very important that sometimes we just accepted incomplete domain knowledge. Um, not trying too hard to complete our knowledge, um, just to say, okay, we think it's like that, we don't know, let's not look too much into the future, let's say it is like that and fix it later. And to be able to do such, such things, um, it was important to try to keep our changes simple and local, because simple and local changes are easier to rechange later on, to iterate upon, and we found that uh, the DDD um, toolkit gave us a good, uh, good tool to judge whether a change, a proposed change was simple and local because it would be simple if it didn't change the ubiquitous language, right? It could just, the change could be described with what we already built up in our ubiquitous language and it would be local if it only affects one bounded context. So that gave us a good heuristic uh, to see, well, let's just do it, let's not think about it too much, we can change it without a big cost later on. And in general, we found that uh, we often took debts and often the payout was good. Sometimes it was not so good. We had some cases which we didn't have time to cover in the talk where really we took a debt and it didn't pay out in the end. Uh, but overall, over all these uh, instances where we did this, we think it, it paid off. We took the debts. Often they helped us make rapid progress, make our customers happy, get on the market with something new. So. The payoff overall was good, we would do it again, uh, and we think it was simply very, very important for us to repay this debt over time in an iterative fashion, just as we were developing the new features of our domain, of our system, uh, iteratively doing the housekeeping and fixing the debts, keeping them all of, all of debt and dealing with them in an explicit way. Um, but we didn't only iterate on these things, we also iterated on our process itself, and I think this was also very important. Remember, we had these frequent team changes, and every time the team changes, um, the process 
potentially changes because people are different. They try to they like to work in a different way. Um, for example, in the beginning, Christian mentioned that we were working in a very async way, using PRs as the main form of collaboration. Um, but when team changes, where well, we try to reflect on that, maybe think: Should we do more pairing, more mob sessions? Let's talk about it. So in the end, I think we stuck, for example, with PRs, but I think it's very important to realize that when your team changes, you shouldn't force your current process on your new team members, but rather try to find out how can they be productive? How do they like to work? And try to collaboratively find a way that makes everyone productive and happy with the process. So we found that these re-teamings, the team changes were an opportunity, or at least we tried to consider them as such. Um, because they did create some work, maybe we had to change um, our process, but they helped us improve our model and technology. We realized our model was bad when the new developer didn't understand it, and often new developers brought new skills to the table. Uh, for example, at some, we started out with server-side rendering for our UI, three back-end developers, what do you expect? But over time, we got some front-end experts, we threw away the server-side rendering over time, and have now a single-page application with nicer UI UX for our users. So, um, I guess these are the main learnings. I want to end our talk with a quote. Um, I consider it as a, a kind of variation of an older quote uh, by Voltaire, perfect is the enemy of good, uh, applied to software development. And it is, of course, by Eric Evans, who wrote, uh, let the conceptual large-scale structure evolve with the application. Don't over-constrain the detailed design and model decisions that must be made with detailed knowledge. I think... That's a very good quote to live by. Thank you very much.